All right, cool. So um, welcome to another edition of the Social Proof Podcast. We have a very, very special guest today. First off, she's my new business partner. We're not necessarily going to tell y'all what we got going on right now. You'll see it for sure. Hey. Um, but uh, Ms. Ernestine Johnson Morrison. Yes. Is it Johnson Morrison or is it Ernestine Morrison? It's Ernestine Johnson Morrison. Let me tell you, it was a really, it was a struggle to get rid of my last name because I, can imagine. I worked hard to be Ernestine Johnson. Yeah. Um, and now that I'm married, <clears throat> five mm -hmm. months strong, um, now I'm, I changed my middle name to Johnson. So I'm Ernestine Johnson. Uh, gotcha, Morrison. gotcha. Okay, I got. Okay, okay. My husband okay. was like, I'm not doing the hyphenating thing, so right. I was like, okay, well, I found the loophole. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the loophole is. <laughs> right, right. Okay, okay. Yes. So well, how would that conversation come about? I mean. You want to be one, but yes. you still had your own brand. Yeah. And typically when companies merge, they have one name. Yeah. Like we got this name. So how was that conversation? The conversation, well, initially before I got married, I was always like, yeah, I'm changing my last name. Like no question asked. Really? And then as the date gets closer, you really start realizing like, wow, my last name is changing. And for me, it became really emotional because I'm like, I had to put sweat, blood, and mm -hmm. tears in to be Ernestine Johnson. And right. I wasn't always this confident, boisterous artist, influencer that you see now. Like there was like really, really like turmoil and emotions and tears and sweat and blood going into building myself to be Ernestine mm. Johnson. So when I realized like, whoa, in a couple of hours I have to change my last name, I was like, you know what? I don't know if I can let it go. It was mm. almost like letting go a piece of me. Right, right, right. But right. I'm all for like nation building and becoming one. So I was like, you know what? I'll just make it my middle name. Mm -hmm. So it's still not my last name, but it's still it's still a piece of me that I have to keep. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, first off, we about to get into why we're having this conversation because you were popping before you were Ernestine Morrison. I was. <laughs> I, I, I've been out in these streets. Right. <laughs> so obviously, for the last little bit, you've been um, obviously just being a good help me where yo, there's one vision. Let's yes. build this joint together. But yes. Give some people background on you and your dope. You've been doing this for a long time. I have, I have. So I started out, I'm an actress and a poet, uh, amongst uh, other things, a business owner. I started out acting in 1998 in Los mm. Angeles, California, in mm. Hollywood. Um, my very first set was Seventh Heaven, Sabrina the Teenage Witch, Parenthood, and I started out as a featured extra. Right. And I, I never forget, I was watching the Cicely Tyson movie, and I was like, Mom, I want to do that. I want to act. I want to make people feel good. And she got me my first Hollywood agent, Academy Kid, Showbiz in Hollywood in the 90s. And I started acting. And I did performing arts in high school mm. and went on to major in theater at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas at UNLV. And then moved to Atlanta after a little birdie told me, Georgia's where it's at. We've got this tax right. incentive. The industry's moving there. That's where you want to be. So instead of going back home to LA, I felt like coming to Georgia, I'd be a bigger fish in a smaller pond. And right. really, I can come here and build my platform. Came here and booked Think Like a Man 2 um, with Kevin Hart and Where's the Love with David Banner and Terry J. Vaughn. And just really, really, really working, building my resume. Um, was on uh, Shots Fired on Fox with Sanaa Lathan and, and 24 Legacy on Fox and started mm. my started my very own movie with, with D, alongside DC Youngfly called Digital Lives Matter wow. uh, on BET. And just, you know, really building my brand. And then I got lucky, and, and uh, not really lucky, but blessed to do a poem on the Arsenio Hall show called Average Black Girl. Right. Um, shout out to Average Black Girl. It's one of my favorite pieces of work. Oh, in but it. you got to tell the story. Yes. You got to tell the story. Yo, she was telling me the story yesterday on really one how the how the thing came about, and really what's for you is for you. Yes. Nothing can stop it. No timing can stop it. Yes. No hurricane. No like tell the story. It's really yeah, cool. yeah. So. I, my mentor is Terry J. Vaughn, and I'm sure a lot of us, most of us know us or should know her. Um, she was LaVita Alizé Jenkins on the Steve Harvey Favorite Show, character. amongst many, many other movies and films that she's done mm -hmm. in the span of her 20-year career. She had a cafe called The Green Room, and at The Green Room, people would come and do open mic, and it was her last open mic before she closed the business down, and I was doing a poem. And I was doing a poem called, Why Did I Let Him Just F Me? Crazy poem. Um, super vulgar, very deep, very transparent but it's lit. So Ooh. I did I did this poem and as I'm Hold on, where did you get the inspiration? <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, was it one day you were sitting there on the edge like of the bed like... Over that? Yeah, I did this poem called Why Did I Let Him Just F Me? But anyway, <laughs> um, I actually
actually wrote this poem in college on the lunch break, working at ESPN Zone, and I was just taking uh, stories around me from all the women who are around me as men, and mm -hmm. just, you know, how men can do sometimes when they don't want to commit. Yeah. And I said, I'm just going to write a poem about it. And I literally wrote this poem on a 15-minute lunch break at ESPN wow. Zone in Vegas, and it ends up going viral many, many, many years later. So I was doing this poem at the green room called uh, Why Did I Let Him Just F Me? Mm -hmm. And as, as I got off the stage, everyone's applauding and everyone's clapping, and David Banner walks up and he holds his hand out and he helps me off the stage. And he's just like, yo, you are dope. He's mm -hmm. like, you're so dope. I want to work with you one day. We stayed in contact and he ended up doing the Arsenio Hall show. Mm -hmm. He did a poem on the Arsenio Hall show. And Before or after he was a rapper? Oh no, this was just four years ago. Yeah, this happened in 2014 yeah. that I did The Average right. Black Girl. Yeah, so he's already a well-established right, rapper right, right, and right. activist and, and, and businessman. When Arsenio Hall's show came back out yes. years ago. Okay, gotcha. the second gotcha, time gotcha. Arsenio. Yeah, I'm not old enough to do the... <laughs> 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 don't try to age me, David. <laughs> no, it, it, it didn't come together in my head. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, so this is 2014, so we're clear. <laughs> um, 2014, so yes. Yeah, so David calls me and says, hey, I just did The Arsenio Hall show. I did a dope poem on there, and they want more poets. And he said, I recommended you. He said, I, I, told, I told them they had to see you. So I was like, okay, what I need to do? He's like, you need to get them a tape by 9 p.m. Um, Pacific time. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm in Atlanta. I said, okay, cool. I don't know anybody with a camera, um, but I called my one, my, my one friend. I said, I don't have a camera, but I know my one girl who has a camera. So I called her and I said, hey, can you get to my house? And can you take me, put me on tape? So mm -hmm. I did this poem called Average Black Girl, taped it in my kitchen. We sent it off to their Arsenio Hall show um, producers and they loved it. And they said, can you come on the next few days? Wow. They think I live in, a, in L.A. Right. And mind you, I'm still working retail. I'm working at Neiman Markets. I'm like, oh, I got to get to <laughs> L.A. last minute. This $900 flight. Right. But I, I did it. I flew to L.A. Mm -hmm. And I'm so excited because it's my first time that I have, like, my own dressing room and my name is on the wall. And mm -hmm. everyone's catering to me and asking no one's sparkling or still <laughs> watered. I'm, I'm just feeling myself. I'm just feeling really, really good. And... Previously to me doing the show, there was a poet by the name of Princess Powell who did the show. Mm -hmm. And he did this poem about like um, fathers and custody and raising their daughters or something like that. Yeah, yourself. and it went viral. Yeah, it was a super dope poem. And I was just, I just remember thinking, sitting in behind in, in, my, in my, uh, my dressing room, right. that I'm just going to go viral and everything's going to be about me and I'm just going to be popping and my followers are going to go up and I'm going to be speaking here and I'm going to mm -hmm. be booked. I'm going to be booked, busy, and blessed. <laughs> and. Um, Sadly, the producers came backstage and says, hey, Miss Johnson, unfortunately, we can't have you on the show today because our first guest spoke too long. Mm. And I was devastated. It was like my whole world came crashing down. Like I was banking on this opportunity. Mm -hmm. So she says, well, Arsenio wants you to come out still and do the poem for the audience and for him. And I was mm. just like, eh, okay, I'll, I'll do it for Arsenio and the audience. So I went out there and I did my thing. And Arsenio said, I have to have his exact words, but I have to have that live on my show. Wow. He said, you are powerful. He said, you are this generation's Maya Angelou, and I need to have that on my show. Mm. So he said, I'm thinking about two weeks. I'll, we'll call you back. I said, okay, cool. So I'm leaving, of course, feeling defeated and feeling like, why me? And I'm not good enough, and mm -hmm. I'm not talented enough, and, you know, the artist woes. Right. And I literally couldn't barely get out the parking lot before they called me back and said, hey, can you make a U-turn? We're gonna have you on the show. We're gonna tape you tonight and air it tomorrow. Mm. So I'm like, oh, I'm like, yes. I'm, I'm like, gonna be popping I'm again. I'm gonna be popping again. <laughs> and so I go back, I do the show, and you know, your, your couple friends on Facebook and whoever watches the show saw it, and right. you just move on about life. So I took the footage and I put it on my YouTube page, and it sat like at 11,000 views for a whole year. No one was really talking about it. I wasn't really getting booked. No one, mm. no one made a big deal of it. Like right. I had this. I had this grand idea in my head that everyone's going to make a big deal of it, and mm. they're going to just be like, oh, my God, this girl needs to be speaking right, everywhere. Right. And for literally 365 days, it sat at 11,000 views, and I was just feeling defeated. And in that 365 days, God was preparing me. I was switching out management teams, and just new opportunities were coming, and God was really just building me and preparing me. And once I was reading some of the comments on my, on my YouTube page, like, you know, you, you saved my life. You stopped me from committing suicide. You made me feel good wow. about being black. You made me feel good about being dark skinned. I think God was taking those 365 days to prepare me to show me, A, I don't work on your time, and B, this gift that I gave you was not about you, and this platform was not mm -hmm. about you. This platform and this gift that I gave you was for you being a beacon of light and hope and motivation and inspiration for young black women and for women all around the world. Mm -hmm. And it took that 365 days for God to prepare me. And that's really when I became Ernestine Johnson. Wow. Yeah. And I think that's just so powerful because people may do something today or they were building their business all 2018. Yeah. And they're like, oh, well, it just didn't work mm -hmm. out when it's probably not going to 
you're probably not going to see the fruits of your labor from 2018 yeah. until 2020 Absolutely. or 2021. Yes. But you got to keep doing it. Yeah. Like you got to stay It's sowing in the game. seeds. I always tell people when you when you plant a tree and you put those seeds in the ground, the, the tree doesn't just sprout up overnight. Right. Like it takes time for the tree to develop, for the leaves to develop, for the branches to develop. So everything that you do along the journey, all the seeds that you plant, they're going to they, they add up eventually and the tree is going to blossom one day. Wow. And you have to take everything on the journey like it's a seed. Mm -hmm. It really is. I worked at ESPN Zone as a hostess, and every morning my manager would say, I need somebody to read the ticker to see to let everyone know what sports uh, games are playing on which television shows, on which, uh, which TVs. And I would read, I would volunteer and read. And I just thought it was reading, but really it was planting a seed for me to become a speaker. Wow. Had I not had that experience reading the ticker every morning and directing which TVs are going to play which game every morning, just working as a hostess at ESPN mm -hmm. Zone, I may not have had the confidence to go on our Arsenio Hall show and, and, and drop the bombs that I dropped. Right, right. Had I not planted those seeds back in the day working at ESPN Zone in college, you know what I mean? Yeah. Or reading the church announcements in church. I remember being 10 years old and I was asked by the youth ministry to read the church announcements in the big church. Mm -hmm. you, know, you go to the big church, and ain't the kids' church, <laughs> the big church. And I was asked at 10 years old to read the announcements. And I'm literally reading the announcements, just reading on the paper. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget this moment. I, I, I almost can smell the room. It, it's so nostalgic. I never forget reading the announcements and that everybody in the church clapped after I was done. And I'm just like, why are they clapping? But it was even mm. then God was showing me it's your diction and your delivery that's going to set you up to do the average black girl in, 15, in mm. 15 years. You know what I mean? So everything along the journey is a seed. Oh, my goodness. That's crazy. Yeah. So real, you're doing some amazing things right now, right? But yes. um, we have to kind of talk about, um, you know, this, this union you just created because yes. two bosses came together. Yes. And for some reason, and, and honestly, me, when someone says, Ernestine Johnson, you're like, I, okay, I heard the name, <laughs> but then they follow up with what? Jay Morrison's wife. Jay Morrison's wife, right? <laughs> yes. So, one, for you to, I think it's like kind of like a Scottie Pippen, Michael Jordan thing, because Scottie Pippen was the man. I always say Scottie my, was the my man. all time favorite basketball player is Scottie Pippen. Right. He was one of the most versatile players, and truth be told, Sometimes there is no Mike without a Pippin. Mm. Mike can't go out and be Mike without a Pippin. Yeah. And I say that about husband and wife sometimes. And, I, and I'll, I'll never forget when everybody was going crazy about LeBron opening the school on Instagram, right? Mm. Everyone's shouting out LeBron and congratulating LeBron, right. which was very respectfully much well due. But I shout out Savannah. I did a whole post about Savannah. I said, shout out to Savannah for being the anchor mm -hmm. because LeBron can't go out and be LeBron unless Savannah is home taking care of the house and kids. Right. <laughs> you know what and I whose mean? Whose job is more important? You they, know what I'm saying? They're equally important. They're equally important. They're equally important. It's the yin and yang. It's, it's, the, it's the balance. And I shout out, I did a whole post to shout out Savannah. Shout out to you, Savannah, for, for being the grounded, resilient woman that you are so your mm -hmm. husband can go out and be who he is to the world. Right. So, one, the Tulsa Real Estate Fund. Yes. Okay. But, I, I mean, you guys are literally making history. Yes. But when we see Re Tulsa Real Estate Fund, it's Jay. He did it. Yeah. He did it, right? So um, let's just kind of clarify some of the things that you're, and, and we're not taking anything away. Jay is a visionary, oh, visionary. Jay's the most He's brilliant man I've ever met. Beast. He's a beast. But nobody nobody can do it all that by, their, by themselves. They just can't. It's so, a team. It takes what, a team effort. So, like, let's bring to the world, like, what is your role? Like, what are the things that you did to make this thing happen? Well, first, for those of our, our, our viewers and your viewers who don't know what the Tulsa Real Estate Fund is, the Tulsa Real Estate Fund is the world's first black-owned real estate crowd fund where we galvanized over 12,000 people to invest as little as $500 mm -hmm. to raise $12 million in our first month to buy real estate assets where we all own and have, have, have equity and where you get 8% preferred returns on your investment and we share 50% of the profits with our investments, our investors and it never, never before has this been done from a, um, a black owned company mm -hmm. or black managed and operated company. So we're really excited about that. And when I first met Jay, I'll never forget, our, our, uh, a mutual friend introduced us, actually someone who was working for him at the time, which was my friend and introduced us and said, wow, you two, operate from the same frequency, you kind of have the same vision, I have to get you two in the same room. Was it a connection or was it like a, yo, girl, listen, be tall? No, it was really <laughs> was like, you're a successful business, and 
what I didn't mention is I own a company called Selfish Swank where I work with over three dozen NFL players mm. um, and personal shop for them, get them ready for the games. So amongst all the cool things I do, that was that was another thing that I did. And my, my girlfriend, Letitia Robb, said, you guys need to meet. There could be some synergy with your clients and real estate and just all the stuff that you do mm -hmm. and uh, as a poet, as an activist, and all the stuff that he does as a real estate guy and an activist as well. So I was like, cool, let's meet. And she just said, I have a good feeling about this. I, I really think you guys should meet. I'm like, cool. And the day that we met in his office, it was magnetic. It was so like, okay, this is wow. this is going to be far beyond a business relationship. Like, this uh, is my husband. I knew from day one. The, you knew from day one. Talking later, did he know from day one? He says he didn't know from day <laughs> one. But I swear to God, everyone thinks he's lying. Everyone in that room, <laughs> including the woman who introduced us, including the front desk girl who just checked me in and was just like, the whole world shook when you walked in the room. Um, wow. I, he says he didn't, but I think he knew, I think he knew within the first few weeks. Mm -hmm. I knew from the day one. You know, women, we think faster anyway. We always see stuff faster than you guys do anyway. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so I knew from day one. So anyway, in that meeting, we had a great meeting. At the end of the meeting, he said, um, he told me about the Tulsa Real Estate Fund, and he said, I'm going to build a black Wall Street. And I said, he said, I'm going to rebuild a black Wall Street. And I said, well, I'm going to be the one to help you build it. That was mm. my last, those were the last words I said before I walked out of his office. And shortly after, we met again, and we're having a lot of business conversations and a lot of talks and the structure of Tulsa and what his ideas are. And, you know, this is before Tulsa was even. When was this? This was in April. Okay. We met in March. 2000. 2017. This last year. Yes. Wow. When Tulsa was, it wasn't even approved by the SEC yet. It wasn't, it was, it was, we're still waiting for our, our mm. approval was pending. And I said, you know what? I have all these people around me with amazing resources and, and a lot of money. They should know about Tulsa. They should know about real estate. They should know about, more importantly, not just real estate, but they should know about building um, generational wealth. Absolutely. And I said I, 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 I was phasing out of getting my clients red bottoms and, and furs and jewelry. I'm like, hey, we got to right. really start thinking assets yeah. and legacy building. And he was like, well, great. This is the, this is the platform that I've created. Mm -hmm. um, how can we partner? And I said, I'm going to get as many eyes as I can right. on this idea and on this brand, because that's just what I do. I'm, 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 a, I'm a connector, I'm a magnet. And so that's how it kind of started. Mm -hmm. It started there as me kind of being a liaison, maybe like a relationship manager, so to speak. But it grew into something um, far bigger than we both even, even knew. Mm -hmm. I remember the first, uh, when we were gonna launch Tulsa, and he said, well, we had, we had this big party and I was like, a party? I'm like, mm, this is a $50 million fund. We can't do a party. I said, we have to do a ball. Mm. So I created the Black Wall Street Ball. And I had everybody wearing gowns and tuxes because I wanted it to be a prestigious, wow. sophisticated event. I wanted black people to see, hey, we can have these conversations around right. finance. And we can show up to these events and, and be sophisticated and do mm. it in a sophisticated, prestigious way. So I created the Black Wall Street Ball, which we did here in Atlanta at the old DeKalb Courthouse. And we sold out. The man would never think about that. Like, yo, it's about to be a party. It's about right, to be pop, about to be a party. Bottles. We'll pop yo, bottles. we need couches that we can stand on. You know what I'm saying? For the yeah, party. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, no, 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 no. It's always a woman's touch to something. So we did this ball. And really the ball, I feel like, set the tone of the branding of Tulsa. Mm -hmm. So now when you see Tulsa, you think prestige. Right. You think black excellence. You think upper echelon. Because we did that ball. And it's like they're wearing gowns. Yeah. They're walking the red carpet. They're at a courthouse. Like, it's a different mm -hmm. thing than what we see every day. Um, so I, I created that. And then as we've been working together and just synergizing and just building and bringing all of our ideas and resources and everything to the table to right. build out this amazing idea that he birthed and he started, um, it, just, it just formed to be a great partnership. And then I went on a 30 city tour with him. We did the corner mm. class tours. If you guys aren't familiar, Jay does this thing called the corner class right. where he goes in the corner and teaches real estate right there in the hood. Mm -hmm. So I joined him. And so now I joined my brand and my brand audience to the corner class. And gotcha. what we were doing in the all 30 cities, we're preaching Tulsa, Tulsa, Tulsa. So now it's not only just his brand audience going live, it's my my Instagram and my Facebook, everyone going live too. So right. I'm introducing my brand. So now, you know, now we're building more investors. Right. Um, just organically, just being beacons of, 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 of hope and light um, for the people. And we just mm -hmm. kind of both had the same vision, like, hey, we want to help people who look like us right. and the working class person and the person who is quote unquote forgot about. And I was doing poetry. He, he would teach on the corner, and I would close every class with my poetry. Oh, wow. So every, every week, we're hitting them with the finance, and then I'm closing that with the poetry. So it's just a feel-good type event. Um, so it. we went on this 30-city tour, and we galvanized all these people. My audience, his audience, were galvanizing on the same street corner. So when we launched Tulsa, 
we had people who already stood with us because they stood with us on the corner. Mm. I held their babies. Jay held their babies. Jay taught you about real estate on the corner in your hood. Mm. We met you where you were at. And so that's why we were able to collectively galvanize right. um, the, the people, really. So if, if you didn't catch this vision that Jay had, right, mm -hmm. where, what path would you be going on? Would you be like kind of building more of your speaker career or your poet career? Like, where that's, do you think? That's a great question. To be honest, a month before I met Jay, I was on my way back to LA. Mm. I already went to LA. I found where I wanted to be. I found my apartment, and I just really was gonna go hard with my acting mm -hmm. because it was I had built such a solid resume here in Atlanta, and I thought I really wanted to get to the next level. And I was like, in order for me to do that, I got to be in LA. Mm -hmm. And I was just gonna move to LA. I was yeah. single doing good financially, my business is thriving, like I'm going to LA. And I'm telling you, it's the power of God will show you where you need to be. Mm. And God was like, nope, this is where you're gonna be, you're gonna be right here because I still need you to use that voice of yours to speak on a 30 city tour with Jay Morrison wow. and use that powerful voice and use that poetry to breathe life into people. Mm -hmm. And you see where I'm so at. you think to yourself, why did I let him fiance me? Why did I let, <laughs> why why did I let, I let him fiance me? me? <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what, I was obedient. And there, it was very challenging because I'm like, God, but this is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm passionate about. But sometimes your passion isn't your purpose. Mm -hmm. And God was like, I know this is what you're passionate about, but this is what I put you here to do. And in doing that, it's going to open up all the other doors for mm -hmm. your passions because now us doing this platform and having this platform, it has opened other doors for acting. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, and that's just, yeah. <laughs> so there are, I can imagine it could be tough and there are some women right now who are, um, who are, uh, uh, they're, they're, they're with a man with a, with a vision, right? Mm -hmm. But is it easy to lose your identity in that? It, it can be. And or, I, or somebody that's not a powerhouse like mm -hmm. you that just wants to be involved in, okay, my, my, my guy is going, or it might be vice versa, but my spouse is going, going, going. I want to be a part, but it's hard for me to catch hold of what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah, it, you know what, it, I, when you're single, you don't think about these things, mm -hmm. especially when you're a powerhouse. You're just like, I'm doing me, I got my businesses, I got my clients, I'm acting, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm on the road, I'm speaking for Congress, I'm doing right. all type of stuff. So as a single woman, you're not thinking about these things, right? And my grandfather said something so powerful to me once. He said, it's not a, he said, a lot of people use the word help mate, but it's not a help mate, it's a help meet. Mm -hmm. Because you're put in each other's life to help each other meet each other's goals. Mm -hmm. And it takes a very selfless person, not even just a woman, but the woman and the man. It takes you to be very selfless to understand that God put you in each other's life to help each other meet each other's goals. God put me in Jay's life to help him with this big vision. Mm -hmm. My man is a genius visionary, and he needed a strong anchor partner mm -hmm. to help him meet this goal. You can't do it alone. Mm -hmm. And you have to do it with the people that God put on your path to do it. And we have an amazing team. It's not just me. We have an amazing team of mm -hmm. people who have helped birth this idea of Tulsa. And, and all the other things that we do together. But it, it is challenging when you don't know who you are. Right. And you have to constantly remind yourself who you are and what you bring to the table, because you can't get lost in the sauce. Mm -hmm. And then you just may think you're just not good at anything and you're not good enough and it's all this person's idea or this person's thing. But when you keep the vision that God put us here to collectively do this assignment, it's an mm -hmm. assignment. So really for me, Tulsa is an assignment. Mm -hmm. God said, I, 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 and, and, and Jay always shares this, God, he said, God told him, if you take care of my people, I'll take care of you. And he was true to that vision that God gave him. And if you, if you keep in the forefront of you that the, God put you guys on an assignment, God put you on an assignment. So it wasn't in my cards to move back to L.A. Mm -hmm. and act and do movies. It was in my assignment that God put me here to help bring this vision together and keep this vision glued together. So when I keep that in my mind, like, okay, I can't start feeling down or start feeling like I gave up on my own dreams or gave up my own passions because what, what, what I keep in the back of my mind is God put me on assignment. Mm. And when you, when you walk in God's purpose for your life and walk in God's assignment for your life and you know that you're doing it for him, nobody else really matters. So it's not like I'm doing this for Jay. I'm not doing this for our team. I'm not doing this for anybody but God. God put me on an assignment and it is my due diligence as a child of God to follow what the assignment he put me on. Mm -hmm. And that's what I have to keep. And, and, and really for all women out there listening, like find what you're good at, find what you are undeniably good at, what your talent is, what your voice is, what your gift is that God put inside of you and use it. And when you bring that to the table, 
No one could ever take your seat away from the table because you're like, mm -hmm. no, God put me here. This is the gift that God put on, 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 on my heart and in my spirit, and he asked me to bring it to this table. And this table wouldn't be here unless I, <laughs> I, brought, this, I, I brought this gift. And you right. have to remind yourself that it's daily homework. Like, i got to rem remind myself, like, no, God put me at this table for a reason. Mm -hmm. The table wouldn't be here without me in this table. <laughs> would nobody eat if I weren't here. I brought the but table. But it's a collective. I it's love a collective. It. It's like, you know, Jesus had the last supper. It was different people at the table. <laughs> different people brought different things. So the, t the table doesn't exist unless everybody at that table is using the gift God gave them to make the table. And why do you, why do you think people have such a hard time being a Scottie Pippen or being the point guard that gives Michael the ball? Like, why do you think people have that problem? Ego. I think a lot of times it's ego. And like I said, if you don't keep God first and you don't remind yourself to just get back rooted in the spirit of God in the assignment that he put you on, you will act out of ego mm. or you will act out of insecurity or you will act out of fear. And there are times where it's like, gosh, like I should, my name should be heard more. Mm -hmm. It should be about me, 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 I. Mm. But you got to bring it back to God. What did God say? He said, this is your assignment. This is your role. This is what you have to do under 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 my umbrella, under my wishes, under my command. And when you say I wake up every morning, this is a prayer. Literally, I say every day, God, let your will be done and not mine. Mm. And as a woman and as a powerful woman, as a dynamic woman, a multifaceted woman, I know what I bring to the table. I know what God put in my heart. I know what gift God gave me. And it is frustrating at times. But you just got to get back to God. Mm. And, you know, whatever your belief system is, my belief system is keep it rooted in God. That's mm. the source. So is there, is there anything wrong with this type of ambition? Like uh, there's somebody in the organization, right? Mm -hmm. That's even looking at you and Jay and saying, yo, I could, I could do that. And I feel like I could be that. Mm -hmm. Like even El Chapo, I was watching the, the movie. El Chapo was like, yo, I, I'm, I'm driving the cars right now, but I could take my man's spot. And not even in a malicious way, but having that type of ambition. Just for instance, say for instance, you were working for somebody. Yeah. And you're like, yo, I'm, I, I, I work here to serve, to mm -hmm. learn, but I know I'm not, I'm not, I'm not an assistant. Right. I'm the star. So right. <laughs> what would you say to that person who has that ambition or is it right or wrong? What do you think? Hmm. That's a good one. And it really just goes back to roles and passion and purpose. And like I said, mm -hmm. sometimes your passion is not your purpose. And it takes a very strong, resilient person to get on your knees and ask God, God, what is the gift? What is my role? And he he will show you. Mm. Sometimes you're meant to be the passenger drive the back in the passenger seat. You're not meant to be the driver. Mm. And then it's not that you can't drive. It's just that the person who's in the driver's seat has a better attention span than you, and he can focus more. <laughs> can, you know what I mean? It's just like everybody has a role. Mm. And if your vision for if your if your if your intention is to is to um, what is the word I'm looking for? If your intention is to complete the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Then you understand everybody has a role and what your how important your role is to the bigger picture. Right. Your goal should be your goal should be to complete the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. And for us, the big the bigger picture is to unite people. Right. So whether Jay gets the credit or I get the credit or our, our, our vice president gets the credit, the goal is God said unite people through financial literacy, unite people through your poetry, mm -hmm. unite people through the corner class. That's what God said to do. So if that is my vision and that is my goal to do what God said to do, I'm not worried about being in my ego about if I get the credit for it or not. Because ultimately God gets the credit. You wow. know what I mean? So um, I want to switch gears a little bit. In dating entrepreneurs, let's say there is a powerhouse woman out there. For one. Which there are many. There are many. <laughs> but do you find that um, powerhouse women who are like the head of their organization is mm -hmm. hard to date? I do. Wow. So I have plenty of, um, I wouldn't even necessarily say friends, but associates who mm -hmm. are very dominant, powerful women. And, and, and I love them. I love them for what they do, for what they've created. But I do feel like sometimes women find it hard. And I may get crucified for this, so don't crucify me. <laughs> but if you do, if you do, I'm here for it. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a bit old school with certain things. And mm. I'm going to be honest, I'm not the one who's completely 100% on board with this new 2018 feminist movement. <laughs> there are some things I agree with and there's some uh -oh. things I don't. Mm. And it could just because just my just how you grew up. You grew up mm. with the Bible. You grew up with, you know, the man is the head of the household. And I am one of those ones who do believe that my man is the head of the household, but I can I, I still add a value. Mm -hmm. I still have a very specific, powerful role. Yeah. And I think that a lot of the times women who are the leaders, 
of the organizations or the CEO find it hard to date because there are still specific needs that a man needs that sometimes women aren't able to break down their barriers to mm -hmm. give them. You right. know what I mean? Like you have to appease your man sometimes. You have to make your man, you know the old saying, make him feel like a man. And I do believe that that is true. There's just certain needs that you guys have. Mm -hmm. And there are certain needs that we have. And I think sometimes when women are so used to being the leaders and being the boss that they don't really know how to translate that into a relationship. Mm -hmm. And I could be wrong, but I, I, I read this book called His Needs, Her Needs. Actually, my husband and I both, both read it. And there are specific needs mm -hmm. that you have as a man. And there are specific needs I have as a woman. And we really wrote ours down. This is what I need. This is what I need. Are you able to do this? Uh, it's almost like a, a, a job application. Mm. Here's what the job is. Here's what the role is. Are you able to do this? Here's the descriptions I need. Are you able to do this, this, and this? And it's up to you as a woman or man to say, yes, I can do this one. Yes, I can do this one. Mm, this one I'm not really comfortable with. So you guys can come to create. Did you have to compromise and say, ooh, that one right? I don't yeah. know if I could. Uh. Yeah, that, they're, okay. they're, okay. they're especially it. dealing with two dominant people. Yeah. I'm a powerhouse. Mm -hmm. My husband is a powerhouse. He's a, he is probably one of the hands down, one of the smartest people I know. But there were sure. compromises that had to be made on both ends. He's mm. like, ah, I don't know. I'm used to, um, <laughs> I'm like, like, I know what you're used to, but right, this, right. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it's like, we both had to make compromises. Mm. Like, what's the most important? What's the top five that's most important? Mm. Now these other five, the, the last on, on, on this list of 10, these we can probably play around with and compromise with, but my top five non-negotiables mm -hmm. are these. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm very clear on setting non-negotiables. I have this acronym for CROWN called Confidence, Resilience, Optimism, Willpower, Non-Negotiables. Mm -hmm. And dealing with people, whether we're business partners, whether we're married, whether we, any type of relationship you have, you have to set non-negotiables with people. And right, they, you right. have to be clear. Mm -hmm. They have to be set from the jump. You can't be in, be, be in it a year and just like, you know what? I, I don't like this. And it's like, you didn't say that from the beginning. So right. at the beginning of any relationship, I say these are the non-negotiables. Mm. You have to teach people how to treat you. Mm. And women, I do think, not all women, but I do think that women who are in um, very high positions in companies or own their own companies or run their mm. own companies find it hard to date because it's hard to find the balance. And I will say... It's hard to find somebody who has that, that, that can match that powerhouseness or it's hard to find the balance in letting somebody in. It's hard to find the balance in letting somebody in because, and I can really specifically speak to the black community for black women. I mean, 70% of us come from one parent household. So mm -hmm. a lot of the times women, especially black women, not all women, but a lot of the times we don't have the example of a man in the house. So mm -hmm. we don't know how a man is supposed to interact with us or how we're supposed to interact with the man. And then you just wake up in your 30 and you're like, oh, I have a husband now. This is a foreign language. We have to learn each other's languages. I don't really know how to maneuver in this situation mm -hmm. because I wasn't taught it. I didn't see the example, so I have to be the one to create it. Mm -hmm. But when you've created an empire, it's hard to create that when you're like, well, I have a whole ship over here that I'm the captain of. Mm -hmm. So how am I supposed to now say, okay, the cap I'm the captain of this ship over here, but this ship we have to co-pilot. Mm -hmm. Now I gotta learn how to do this. I have to learn how to co-pilot with you mm -hmm. because this is a foreign language to me. I know what to do over here. My employees work for me. Mm -hmm. I know I know how to tell right. them what to do. But you're my husband or my wife. Now we have to really learn strategically how to co-pilot. And that sometimes is, is that's the challenge. What was what were some of the things you personally had to adjust in marriage? Like you just and maybe <laughs> it's something you're still working on where you gotta keep reminding. I think we're yourself. still working on it. I think everyone <laughs> I think it's a never ending thing. I think right. it's daily homework. Just like working on yourself is daily homework. Mm -hmm. reading books to feed your soul, working out to make sure you look good and feel good and mm -hmm. do good and eating right, is a, it, that's a daily thing. When you're in a relationship, it's a daily work. Yeah. Give me one you have, like, you're working on right now, like, uh, I'll, go, I'll go first. So for me, uh, when I'm out of town, um, calling my wife. Because uh -huh. once I'm out of town, I'm always with somebody and I'm just going, 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 <laughs> oh, going, no, going. Oh, no, no, I don't play that, honey. I don't oh, play that. Oh, man, and time zones, time zones. So if I'm in L.A., it's 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 only one o'clock, but it's four o'clock in Atlanta, and then it's four o'clock, then it's seven o'clock, and you it's nighttime. Find the time, it's like, honey, you better find it. I'm working <laughs> on, but I, and I just don't think about it. So I'm just saying, I'm being don't don't judge me, y'all. Y'all got some too. Y'all got some too, and I hope my wife is watching this. I'm working on it. Too. So what's something you had to work on? Okay, something I have I had to work on, and or still have, have I, I work still on. have to work on, is ha oh, there's two things. I'm gonna give you two. I'm bossy. Mm -hmm. Any 
my Pisces out there, Pisces, we're just bossy. <laughs> and again, I'm used to running my own ship. I'm used to being the captain of my ship. Mm -hmm. And I'm bossy. And my husband does not like to be told what to do. Mm -hmm. So I've had to, let me give you guys a secret. I've had to find strategic ways <laughs> <laughs> on telling him what to do without right. telling him what to right, do. Right, So, right. like, if I, I have just found ways to use my words. I have a way with mm -hmm. words. So I found my way, I have found a way to use words to, like, ask him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I'm really like telling him, but <laughs> I, I put it in a question it. form. Right. Like, um, babe, don't you think we need to leave 10 minutes early so we're on, so we're on time? Because <laughs> really what I want to say is, right. come on, we're going to be late, let's go. Right. And he doesn't register that. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, you know what, babe, do you think we should be on time for this one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we should, right? <laughs> for this one. <laughs> Like, uh, you, we should leave a little early. How, how yeah. early you think? Early you know, 10 minutes. Yeah. We're going to leave 10 minutes yeah. early. Oh, now you know, that's a good idea, babe. That's a good, you're right, 10 minutes. <laughs> um, and, and really having the last word. So my mom will tell you, Ernestine has always have to have the last word. And sometimes my husband's like, I just need you to say okay sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know what? I can do that for you, babe. And that's something I'm working on. Like, I want to say something back, but I'm just like, <laughs> okay, you're right. Right. And it's really just like choosing your battles. Does everything have to be a battle? Hmm. No. And again, when you're, when you're used to being the boss, everything hmm. can be a battle because I'm the boss. But we have to realize right. when it's a relationship, it can't be that way. It can't, hmm. Everything can't be a battle. Right. So it's like, you know what? Which battle am I going to choose this week? Is this the bigger battle than this one? Right. No, I'm just, let, me, let me weigh the battles. <laughs> right. When you met your husband, were you full, like, were you, like, were you open to relationship? Or, like, at that point, you were, like, just full, boom, I'm full business. And then you know what? Before I met my husband, I really was just on a mission mm -hmm. because I, 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 I made the conscious decision. I'll never forget. I was 29 years old. It was my last night of being 29. And I was, you know, dating off and on, dating different people, texting, having text buddies, friends, mm -hmm. dinner dates, whatever. None of it was really working. And I said, God, I just want what you have, what you have for me. And I want you to rid me of any shame, doubt, fear or guilt so I can walk into the woman that you want me to be. And I'm asking you now to prepare me to be a wife because I want to be a wife. So I never asked for a husband, a husband. I never asked God for a husband. I said, God, please prepare me to be a wife. Mm. And I was just on a mission. I was just doing all the things that I felt like I needed to do to prepare me, eating right, working out, reading books, meditating, pouring myself into my craft, d doing more acting classes and workshops, writing more, just really becoming me, mm. becoming the woman that God wanted me to be. So when I met Jay, I was prepared. Had I met Jay, a year prior, I wouldn't have been ready because mm. I wasn't prepared. And I, and, I, and I say this all the time, don't ask God for what you want, ask him to prepare you for it. Ask him to prepare you for the dream wow. house, the dream car, the dream wife, the dream, the dream husband. He already knows what you want. He knows all your heart's desires. But what we're not doing is asking him to prepare us. Mm. You want to be the businessman, the CEO, the businesswoman, but you haven't asked God to prepare you to give you the business acumen to even walk in the, re the meetings and have the conversation. Yeah. You just want to wake up and be the boss. Mm -hmm. But you just say, God, prepare me to be the boss. And I, I really just prepared myself. It was mm -hmm. just a year of preparation and when I met him, I was just like so confident. Mm -hmm. And he even said, he said, you're the first woman I met that I just really looked at as a peer and like, you're just really on your ish. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I just, I did the work. And yeah. I wasn't looking for you, but I was looking for me. I was looking for me to walk into the woman God wanted me to be and wear my crown. Mm -hmm. And when I met him, it was just like, it was all, it's all good. Wow. So for somebody that's out there that is the entrepreneur <laughs> boss, she's running her show. What are three things that you would tell that woman mm -hmm. to like, how can they start to prepare for a husband or just for life for let's let's say a husband in a relationship, because mm -hmm. I know it's a big thing. Like mm -hmm. it's like the better you do, the harder is to find somebody. And here's why I think so. The better a woman does, mm -hmm. people who aren't doing some men, most men, they feel intimidated uh -huh. by that boss, which means the woman has to like kind of date. So up. is that a really a thing? Men, oh, feel, men feel intimidated. For sure. I I give you an example. Did you get hollered at more when you were dolled up ready for the club, or when you were in the grocery store in your sweats and you chilling? Um, I I never was really like the dolled up going to the club to. I, I mean, I've always just got, I've always got hollered at. Even when I was Excuse working, me. when I was working for Neiman Marcus as a sales associate, like mm -hmm. I was always being hollered at. That's what <laughs> being, being hollered at. Let me fix at. this for you. Let me, I'm going to put you, put you, hold on guys, because I don't want to cheat her audience. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I, I was, but I can say when I met my husband, he did say at first, the first meeting, 
he's like, he knew there was something special about me, but he did say it seemed like it was just a lot. Like, I had a lot going on. I was a business owner. Mm -hmm. I was an actor. I was a poet. He was like, you just had so much going on that I was kind of just like, oh, she's dope. Yeah. But he said he wasn't looking at me like in a romantic way because he said it was just a lot. He was like, you just had a lot going mm -hmm. on. Um, but I feel like when you are, I will say this, though, when you are in certain, when you are of a certain stature and you are making a certain amount of money or running a business, I think. I would imagine, I would think, or hope that your circles are really matched that as well. Mm -hmm. So I've always kind of been in circles where I'm around peers, where I'm around other business owners and mm -hmm. women who are doing amazing things, so, and men who are doing amazing things. Right. So I don't, I don't think I ever really had, not that, I, not to my knowledge at least, like a man like, oh my gosh, she's just too intimidating, because I've always been around a man who's had just as much as I have. Mm -hmm. You know. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Well, for most women, they'll attest to the fact that, well, men. We are intimidated by a woman who may be doing better, mm -hmm. which means a woman has to kind of like date up. And there's a lot of issues that come with dating up because as a man, when you're up, mm -hmm. you know you're up. Yeah, you know what I'm right. like, and, and I, I mean, that's just the dynamic that I've But see, realized. here's the thing. Well, I would rebut and say, well, as a woman, when you're up, you know you're up. I've literally always been in circles where everyone around me was up with me. So right. it's like- but for a man, being up comes with a lot of, I want that one, I want that one, I want that one, I know I can get that one. That's why we get the cars and we, we know we, we need that up, right? But for a woman, for the most part, she's not like, ooh, I can smash him. Ooh, let me get that one right there. Ooh, I'm up. It's different. It's different. I will say this. When I took my year of preparation, just really preparing myself, I really was unstoppable. Mm -hmm. I was just like, I can have anybody I want. I can do anything I want. I can create any business I want. I can bring any idea to fruition. Mm -hmm. So as a woman, when you know who you are mm -hmm. and you're wearing that crown, that confidence, that resilience, that optimism, that willpower, saying non-negotiables, you really do say, well, yeah, I could date him. How, did, how do you develop that right there? How do you develop it's that? It's the preparation. Ta it's, tell it's, them how to prepare. Listen, in order for you to wear your crown, and I say build your crown, not just wear it, because people just think you can wake up and, and, and be a queen and, and wear this crown. You have to build the crown. You have to build the confidence, the resilience, the optimism, the willpower, and have the confidence to set clear non-negotiables. And that comes from preparing yourself, being the best version of you that you can be, eating right, reading, um, um, just pouring into yourself, sowing seeds into yourself, and not for nobody but for you. And when you become that woman, you do have a little more uh, confidence. You do, your, your shoulders are back a little more like, what's up? Mm -hmm. Like, had I met a Jay Morrison two years prior to I met him, I wouldn't have been ready because mm -hmm. I didn't do the work on me to where I feel like I was deserving or worthy enough of a Jay Morrison. Mm -hmm. I would have met him like a, probably a fan, like, oh, hi, nice to meet you. Mm -hmm. I would have shrunk. Right. But when I met Jay, I walked into his office like, I got what you got, what's up? Mm -hmm. How are you? You right. know what I mean? How can we build? How can I offer you? Because I got a lot to offer. How can I offer something to your business? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I really genuinely felt like I'm unstoppable. Right. Like, you ever date down? I've never dated down. Really? No. You never been on the, you never read a poem, why did I, why did I fund him? Why? Well, you know what? <laughs> Yo, like, why did I F him? What That's I, the dopest. You know, I can't say, I, I guess speaking maybe for college, high school, I'm sure there's times where you, mm -hmm. But even then, no, like I was a college athlete. See, but that's what that's where we're coming from. Mm -hmm. Because certain women aren't gonna date down and we're like kind of down. Not down in terms of like struggling, but we might be just not up. Like we not there yet. But see, I was a college athlete. I've been an athlete since I was 12, so I dated athletes. So you date who you're around. True, like true, I was true. around athletes in college, I dated athlete. I was around athletes in high school, I dated an athlete. My 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 high school sweetheart was on the football team. And then I went to college and dated somebody else uh, on the basketball yeah, team. Okay. <laughs> so I've always, I, I felt like I've always dated in my peer group. And mm. then, you know, I, before I was married, I was dating a surgeon. Like, I just, I don't know, <laughs> I just like. That'll give you the confidence. That'll give I, you the confidence. I've had, I've had the confidence, like, not, not to say I've always just been super, super confident, but I have always known that God gave me a special gift. Mm -hmm. And there's m women who are far more beautiful than I am, far better bodies than I am, smarter than I am, probably way more accomplished than I am, but I've always known what God gave me was special and I've always held that. Even yeah. as a poet, I'm like, there's dope poets out there. Shout out to all the poets out there. But I know when I get on stage, it's different. And I've had that since 10 years old. Yeah. When I get on a stage, it's, a di it's different. Yeah. It's people can do word play better than me, similes, metaphors right. better than me, but I know what I have is God gifted. It's like Floyd Mayweather said, Floyd Mayweather said, I'm not a talented athlete, I'm a God gifted athlete. 
what this is what this is is a gift mm. from God. And I have the same I have the same mentality. When I get on the stage, it's, it's it ain't a poem. Mm -hmm. It's words from God. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that. <laughs> wow. Yo, one I I I one, I think I have a whole bunch more to talk about, but uh, I don't want to go an hour and a half into the podcast. I think we need a part two for me. I, oh, for sure. Oh, for sure. So, but I, I, I end the show off the same way every time. Okay. Um, I like to make predictions. Okay. So, I want you to make a prediction of Ernestine Johnson Morrison mm -hmm. five years from now, five to ten years from now, because I want to be able to point at this five to ten years from now and say, yo, Ernestine said she was going to do that. Yeah. And look, she did it. That's yeah. crazy. I have the footage. Yeah. So give me uh, your Let prediction. me tell you I'm the manifest queen. Mm. Last year in January, I was at the top of Stone Mountain, and I said I'm going to be engaged before the end of 2017, before I met my husband. Mm. Anything I've ever said I wanted to do, I said I wanted to move to Atlanta. I said I wanted to save this amount of money to move to Atlanta. I said I wanted to work at this job. And it's really, me being a poet, I already believe there's power in words, and you speak life into everything. And this... Five years from now, I will be a young Oprah. I'll be a young mogul. mogul. I'm, I'm building a studio right now, a 30,000 square foot studio with the Tulsa Real Estate Fund, Black House Studios. And my mind is set on a billion. I, w I, w I wanna be a billionaire. I'm going to be mm. a billionaire. I'm going to be a media mogul and I'm going to have messages that spread a positive narrative for people of color, for working class people, for women and I will do it and, and be a billionaire while doing it. Wow. I'm, there it is. There <laughs> it is. So I'm, okay, right now I'm talking to the people that's watching this. Five, ten years from now, she said she was going to do it. Now yeah. just Google Ernestine Morrison. Okay, she's she's there now. So <laughs> thank y'all so much for thank tuning you in. For uh, me. And please let people know how they can find you. Yes, please follow me on the gram, Mrs. Ernestine Morrison. That's M R S Ernestine, E R N E S T I N E Morrison. On my website, ErnestineMorrison.com, and subscribe to my YouTube, Ernestine Morrison. Cool, cool. And yes, she will be at the Social Proof Conference yeah. in Atlanta, April 4th and 5th. You will see. Of Ernestine Johnson Morrison. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh. <laughs>